There is a show that comes on late night on TBS, and it's one of those political satire kind of late night shows, and it's hosted by a lady named Samantha B. And she's a comedian, and her kind of style of comedy is to kind of be crude and confrontational and condescending and she really doesn't have a whole lot of nice things to say about Christian people, especially those who are involved in politics. And her show comes on after a show that we really like that's kind of in that rerun phase, and, and uh, we usually turn this show on while we're going to bed. It's kind of the show that you fall asleep and it's still on the television and I usually wake up about an hour later, and when I wake up to turn the TV off, it's right in the middle of her show. And so, you know, you just kind of for a few moments hear just these just incredibly antagonistic statements about people of faith. And Wednesday night, I woke up, as usual, right in the middle of her show. And she was in this very vile rant about abortion rights. And I went from like this half asleep kind of a thing into just absolute anger in about 30 seconds after I was listening to what she was saying. And her worldview and my biblical worldview is like two trains going at full speed for a head on collision. It is going to be ugly, noisy, and it is not going to end well. And so I flipped off the TV, and I'll be honest with you, from what she said, I was so angry that I couldn't go back to sleep. So I, I got up, I started walking around the house, and you know, it's, it's that moment when you want to get on Twitter in the middle of the night and just really say something snide and prove how smart you are and how dumb they are, right? That's what I wanted to do which is a recipe for regret, right? That, that, you shouldn't be Twittering anything after you've just woken up from a dead sleep, no matter how smart you think you are, right? So I refrained from that and just kind of put my phone up, and, and I was just walking around the house thinking through the things that she said, and in my anger, this is what came to my mind. Why don't you pray for Samantha B's salvation. And it gave me a completely different perspective. And for the last few days, that's exactly what I have done. I have uh, put it on my computer in the office, and I have the name of Samantha B and Jason Jones, who is her husband, who is an actor, and I have been praying every day for the last couple of days that the Lord would lead them to salvation. And you probably have some Samantha B's in your life. You probably have some friends or family members where they don't appreciate your faith and those conversations have gotten ugly. And, and there's probably a lot of hard feelings in that. And you may be to the point right now in your relationship with them where you are kind of like, we just don't talk about this anymore. I don't, I don't bring up my faith they don't say anything about it. We just, to keep the peace, this, we talk about a lot of things, but just not this. And whenever we talk about baptism on August the 18th, and I tell you to imagine your friends and family standing there being saved, this person is not in your imagination, right? They're, 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 you feel like there's no chance. They're so antagonistic to this. I don't see them standing in the middle of a pond with me about to, about to be baptized. They're a hater. But I, I want to ask you to do something really unusual this morning. Here's, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to imagine them again, or maybe for the first time, maybe not August the 18th, but I want you to put them back on your radar. I, I want you, whenever you think about this, I want you somehow to get in your mind that, yes, one of these days, they could be converted and radically saved and come to know Jesus. 
And, and I'm going to ask you to do something even more radical than that. I, I, I know that Thanksgiving dinner probably goes better when you don't talk about these things. But I want to encourage you somehow to be able to talk, about them, to talk to them about your faith and share the gospel with them again. And I know just thinking about that brings a lot of tension. And it also brings a question. How, what do I say to someone who doesn't want to hear this from me? How, how do I enter into that conversation? What I want to show you this morning is some things that we can learn about how to approach a hater. And we are going to learn these things from Acts chapter 9, which is the story of the conversion of the Bible's biggest hater. It's a guy named Saul. And, and if you look at Acts chapter 8, if you'll flip left in your Bible, just one chapter back, I want you to look at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, and we're introduced to Saul with the words, and Saul approved of his execution. That's the execution of one of the first deacons. His name is Stephen, and they just stoned him. And, and to, to tell you more about Saul, look at verse 3. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Go to Acts chapter 9, now the chapter that we're going to be in for the rest of the morning. Look at this, he's gathering letters, and he's making a journey so that he can arrest anyone that he meets, and he calls them people of the way. To bring them bound to Jerusalem. And the Bible, look at the first verse, says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now, this guy makes your friends and family like a snowflake. I mean, he is intense in his hatred of the church and of Christ. He makes Samantha B look like a children's show. This is a really radical hater of the gospel. But an amazing thing is going to happen. He's going to come to Christ. And we're going to look through that story this morning. And as we do that, I want to show you some ways. How do we approach a person who is antagonistic to the gospel? I'm going to give you four things this morning. Number one, here is this. Here it is. Our reaction is natural. Our reaction is natural, but it can't be final. Our re the things that you feel are natural to feel against a person who's antagonistic to your faith, but those feelings can't be the final part of this. The natural reaction to Samantha B. for me is anger. I, I get angry listening to her for 30 seconds. She, she has a way of riling up in me everything that is not good against her. I do not like to listen to anything that she has to say. That is my natural reaction. Your friends and family that you've, you've had some interactions with who are antagonistic to the faith, you probably have some emotion that's in you right now, probably anger, maybe sadness, maybe just this fierce rage that you feel that all those reactions are natural reactions. In Acts chapter 9, Saul, we're going to look at it in just a few moments, but he is going to be saved, but there are some natural reactions to his conversion. If you, if you go on down to uh, about verse 13, you're introduced uh, to, or verse 10, you're introduced to a man named Ananias. He's a follower of Christ. And after Saul is saved, the Lord comes to Ananias and tells him, Hey, I need you to go get Saul. And look at verse 13. Look immediately at what Ananias does. He brings up their emotional history. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. In other words, Ananias is politely telling the Lord, I don't think so, right? The Lord's telling him, hey, you got to go. Ananias, dude, I've heard about this guy. He's fearful of Saul. He's scared of Saul. That is a natural reaction. 
if you go later on down to verse 26, it says that the disciples, they heard, he attempted to, talking about Saul, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, and they did not believe he was a disciple. They'd rather believe that he was some undercover agent who was really coming in to arrest them. They have a very strong emotional reaction of fear to the news of Saul's conversion. What is your natural reaction to people who are antagonistic of your faith? That is natural. But here's the deal. You can't let that be final. There is another emotion that the Bible calls us to, not to ignore the things that we really feel, but one of the things that we've got to move toward is an emotion the Bible calls compassion. And compassion is trying to sympathetically understand another person. It's literally you trying to emotionally connect with this person. And if you'll remember back to the first week of this series, you remember back to Luke chapter 15, we talked about three lost things, two lost things, one a lost son. And there was a son, the Bible calls a prodigal, who was very hateful to his father. It's a very emotionally charged scene. And the son goes away, and he wastes everything that the father gives him on riotous living. But you remember the scene where the son is coming back, and the Bible says that the father saw him afar off? And it says that he saw him afar off and noticed the word because he had compassion for him. Yes, there's probably a lot of hurt. Yes, there's probably a lot of anger. But one of the things that he is doing is trying to sympathize with his son. The Bible says that Jesus does the same thing for us. There, there's a passage in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, that says that Jesus looked at a crowd of people and he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Listen, Jesus has compassion for us. If you are saved, you can have, in Christ, compassion for others. How? Why? Here's the deal. Instead of focusing on what they say to you and the words they used, compassion says, focus on the word they don't know. They're saying what they're saying because they don't believe this. Listen, instead of focusing on what they're saying to you, compassion says focus on the tragedy that they don't know the Lord. You know, when I was kind of stopped in my tracks and I had that thought hit my mind, hey, why don't you pray for Samantha B's salvation? I began to have compassion for her and realized, listen, all the things that she's saying to make me angry, the real tragedy in the world is not that Brian Branham is angry. Who cares? The real tragedy of the world is that Samantha B. does not know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. That's what compassion helps us to see. Then brings us to the second point, which is very important. How do you approach a hater? Remember this, it's not about me, it's always about him. And when I mean him, I mean Christ. It's not about me, it's always about Christ. Now, let's look at Saul's conversion. The Bible says in verse 3 of chapter 9, As he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise Enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now that is quite a story. A hater walking along the road, a great light hearing a voice from heaven, having a conversation with Jesus. That is a miraculous, marvelous thing to see someone come to Christ like that. But did you catch the conversation? Did, did you notice what Jesus said? 
why are you persecuting? And he didn't say, my church. He said, why are you persecuting? And he didn't mention another person. He said, why you are you persecuting me? And notice that whenever Saul asked him, who are you, Lord? He answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I want you to understand this. Whenever people say things to us and they're antagonistic to us, Jesus takes it extremely personal. You know why? Because he identifies with his people. That is a real truth of the Bible that we need to wrap our heart and our mind around. And if you can't wrap your mind and heart around the idea that Jesus identifies with his people, then you will not go very far in sharing the gospel. This is essential to understand that he identifies with us. Listen, the Bible in Ephesians chapter 4 calls us his body. The Bible calls us in Ephesians chapter 2 his temple, his people, his nation. We are his and he identifies with us. And did you know that Jesus taught us that persecution would not be an exemption but an expectation? And listen to what Jesus says about our persecution. I want you to notice this in the identity of it. He says, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these, listen to this, all these things they will do to you on account of me, why? Not because they disagree with you politically, not because they think that you're a weird Christian. Listen, the reason they're going to do this is because they do not know him who sent me. Whenever people say things to you and they're antagonistic to you, yes, it makes us very angry. But you have to realize in our identity with Christ, at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's always about him. And have you ever read those passages in the Bible whenever people are persecuted and they count it a joy to be persecuted for Jesus? They look at that and going, wow, they can see Christ in me and it's making them angry and they just beat me up and threw me in prison. Praise the Lord, right? That, that's, that, that's the transformation of identifying with Jesus is that you really begin to say, yeah, they're getting angry at me because of my faith because they can see Jesus. They're hearing that. Thank the Lord Jesus that you are identifying and using me in that moment. That is such radical thinking. But we have to understand the power of him identifying with us. It's not about us, it's always about him. Number three, here's the, here's the way you approach a hater. Think process, not presentation. Think process, not presentation. If you go down to verses 10 through 19, we mentioned Ananias here just a moment ago. But the Bible says that Ananias is told by the Lord, hey, you need to go to Saul. And Ananias says, I don't want to do that. But if you look at verse 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. Here he has authority from one of the chief priests to bind all who call him. But the Lord said, go. He's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed, entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul... The Lord Jesus who appeared to you by the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. If you look down at verse 27, whenever the disciples have that kind of emotional history with Saul and they don't believe him, the Bible says a man named Barnabas is the one who brought Saul to them and kind of gave Saul credibility before the disciples. Saul needed some people to step in and help him get there, all right? Now, for Saul, the process was watching the reaction of Stephen to his stoning. Man, Stephen saw the Lord. I'm sure while Saul is holding their coach and 
holding that warrant in his hand, and, and Stephen is not reacting like he thought he would. He is not renouncing his faith. He is talking to Jesus while rocks are pelting his head and blood is running from his body, and he is breathing his last breath. He is vocalizing the same words of Jesus, forgive them for their sin. It's an amazing scene. I guarantee you that was a part of the process. And then there's a process for Saul after. Someone is bringing him, giving him credibility. Someone is discipling him. I love what Ananias does. Man, Ananias heals him, prays for him, feeds him. He welcomes him. He shows hospitality for him. This is all part of the process. If you read the book of Galatians, you'll see the long story of Paul, man, he, or Saul who becomes Paul, of the process of how he moved from his salvation to becoming that apostle and it wasn't an easy road. There was a process to it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get out of your mind this idea right here. Ready? Get out of your mind that with your hater, your mission of life is to say something so amazing that the lights come on, they go to their knees, and they are saved like Saul on the Damascus Road. That is not your mission, all right? Now, now, as wonderful as that moment is, your hater is probably not going to come to Christ like Saul did, right? And it is not our business to say something so amazing that it just stops them in their tracks and they come to Jesus. That is probably not going to happen. Here's what the hater is wanting to see from you. Your reactions. When you say something about your faith and they belittle it, they hate on it, they curse it, cuss it, they spit venom at you, they ask really hard questions of you, you don't know how to answer, and you're filled with fear, and you're mad, and you're angry. Listen, the hater is not wanting to know what you're about to say, the hater is really wanting to know how you're about to act. Because if you get into the hateful anger antagonism just like them, that's, that's not impressive to them. They're not really even looking for an answer from you. They're just looking for a reaction to see if your faith is real. One of the things that Samantha B. brings up a lot is the idea that politically, before the 70s, Christians really weren't involved in politics. As a matter of fact, a lot of preachers were saying that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. And then all of a sudden in the 70s, you had Jerry Falwell and the Moral Majority, and he puts together this group who has helped elect a whole lot of Republican presidents, and she's saying, hey, Christians, why the change? One of the things that Samantha B. does a lot is she points out history and hypocrisy. She really does, and it'll make you really mad. But you know what? I really don't, I really don't, she's just trying to get a stir out of us, but I think what she's really wanting is an answer. And one of the things that that causes me to do is, you know what? She, she makes you stop and think through some things I hadn't thought through. And so one of the things that I'm praying for her is, God, please send somebody in her life that can help her see through, past, beyond the politics. It can help her see Jesus clearly. Because that's what she needs to see. Not political. She needs to see Christ. Hey, listen. It's a process. Don't think of that expectation as you're going to make a presentation, they're going to be saved. A long process before and after. Before they're looking for reaction, after they're looking for hospitality. Before they're wanting answers, after they're wanting discipleship. So you and I are a part of a process, not a presentation. Number four is this. Remain prayerful, hopeful, and faithful because of the potential. Remain prayerful, hopeful, and faithful because of the potential. Why is it that I want you to imagine seeing the hater standing with you being baptized? Why is it I'm telling you to put them back on your list, to get them back on your radar? Here's why. Because God has a marvelous way of taking the hatred of the hater after they're saved and turning it into an incredible passion for Jesus. He has a wonderful way of doing that. And the reason I'm asking you to imagine their conversion is this. Imagine what that person may be like for Jesus if they turn to him. 
Don't think of them now. Think of them what they might be like when they're saved and how God may use them in an incredible way. That's exactly what happens to Saul. Saul, you're more familiar with Paul, the Apostle Paul. This is the guy that becomes him. And he is the one, the Bible, the Bible in the book of Acts, the story of the book of Acts is, you shall be, Acts 1-8, you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul is that uttermost parts of the earth movement of the gospel. He will take the gospel into Asia Minor, into Europe, and even provoke church movements in North Africa. It's incredible how the Lord uses him. And the Lord indicates in his talk to Ananias, hey, listen, Ananias, here's where you, why you've got to go. Verse 15, he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. You may have anger towards your hater, but God has a great plan for them. you got to see that instead of your emotional reaction, right? And, and you look later on, and, and we have a wonderful verse, one sentence, verse 28, that kind of tells you what is going to become of Saul. It says, so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. What an incredible verse. So listen, don't think about your reaction to your hater. Think about the potential plan that God has for them. That'll keep you prayerful, hopeful for that person to be saved because you see the potential. There is a long list of people who are antagonistic to the gospel that were radically, marvelously saved that God has used in a great way to be witnesses for him. Let me give you a, a short list of them. You think of history. You think of Constantine, who, who really is the one who helped Christianize the Roman Empire. You think of Augustine, who wrote The City of God, all these great treatises that kind of helped form the foundations of our doctrinal faith as a church. C.S. Lewis, I mean, he hated Christ. And then all of a sudden, he comes to know Jesus, and he becomes one of the most prolific Christian writers who shape our thought. Anthony Flew, who, is, uh, who became a Christian philosopher. Francis Collins, Lee Strobel, who wrote The Case for Christ. He was very antagonistic to the faith until he began to investigate it. Now he's written some of the greatest books that, that help us to explain our faith in apologetics. Think about actors and artists. Alice Cooper, guy went from like, biting heads off of bats and stuff, I mean, weird, to preaching Jesus. Hey, I'm going to tell you, you catch yourself on fire on stage, and then all of a sudden you're preaching Jesus, I'll listen to you, all right? <laughs> You've got a story. I think, I think I'd like to hear more about that, right? Dude, Brian Branham walks in the room to tell somebody about Jesus. Psh, who are you? Oh, there's Alice Cooper. Let's listen to him, right? I mean, this becomes an amazing thing. Brian Welch, who was the guitarist for Corn, You look at this dude, he would give you nightmares to look at him. Now he has a wonderful story of how he came to Jesus. He is a great Christian witness. Kurt Cameron, Mark Wahlberg. Think about artists, athletes, singers, writers, movie stars who were so antagonistic to the faith and then all of a sudden they came to know Jesus. And it's like the Lord stopped me in my tracks and said, Brian, what if Samantha B was saved? Instead of you twittering back to her. Right? <laughs> Won't you pray for her? Can you imagine how much people would pay attention and all the things that she's already said to see her come to Christ? Can you imagine the platform she would have? way greater than I would ever have to ever bring somebody to Jesus. Hey, listen, you may have hatred for your hater, but God has a great plan for them. You can't minimize that. Listen, one thing that we need to see overwhelmingly in this story is this. In Him, all things are possible. Even the conversion of your haters. Man, God wants to do something incredible in their life. So here's, here's where I kind of want to end things today. I want to ask you to do this. I want to ask you, maybe it's in your Bible or on a little piece of note or something, but I want you right now, I want you to take just a second, and somebody that you have taken off the radar, 
that you no longer pray for, consider, you wouldn't even think about sharing the gospel with them. And I want you to put their name on a list, and I want you to move it back to the top. I want them to be on the top of your prayer list. I want them to be in the front of your Bible. I want them to be sitting on your computer. I want you to be praying for them every day, every day. Go ahead and do that. And the next thing I want you to do is this. You don't imagine them on August the 18th standing with us in baptism. I want you to see them there. I want you to put them back in your mind's eye. And it may not be August the 18th, it may be next August, it may be 10 August from now, whatever. But I want you to think of what it might be like if that person comes to Jesus, what the Lord may do through them. And then here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to ask the Lord to help you be bold. Listen, to help you endure persecution, not take it personal, but to endure persecution for His sake. Because of who he is. Because of where they go if they don't know Jesus. Put that in perspective. I want you to ask the Lord for this. God, in all the emotion that I feel, give me compassion. Give me compassion. Teach me compassion. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me for just a moment. And if you're here this morning, and hey, listen, if you're a hater... Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here. And this morning, if you walked in here and you said, Brian, I was incredibly antagonistic to, my, to, your, to the faith, but this morning I feel like something's happening in me and I want to be saved, what do I do? You pray to the Lord right now. But if you're not quite sure how to answer those questions, we have some people down in front who are going to help you. We have some people after the service. We'll sit and talk. Whatever you need, man, we're so glad you came to Liberty today. And we want to be able to answer your questions hear your objections, share the gospel with you. But maybe you're here today and, and man, you, you want to be saved. You're like, I, man, I know what, let's come, come. Come to this altar. We'll talk to you. Maybe you're here this morning and you were a hater. And God's now using you as a wonderful vessel to share the passion of the Lord. Thank God for Him and you. But you come this morning and pray that the Lord will help you be bold. Then I want you to come this morning. If you've moved a name to the top of your list, I want you to begin today praying for them by coming to this altar and asking, Lord, make me bold. Help, t- Lord, teach me compassion. God, give me a heart to suffer persecution for your sake. And Lord, I pray for your mercy on this hater's soul. God, please, safe them. You can use them in such a marvelous way. Heavenly Father, God, fill our altar this morning with tears. Compassion for the lost. Fill this altar, Lord, in these streets with bold witnesses as we walk away from this place. Lord, use us as vessels to bring hardened people to Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? If the Lord's calling you this morning, would you come right now? Come on.